information to us again, um, uh, Marcia, because we need to know those things. We need to learn where we can go to learn those things. Um, our speaker this evening is a dear friend. We've known um, Paul Tenkati. He's a political, uh, I'm sorry, a pro prolific writer, a dedicated historian, a fascinating speaker, and his day job just happens to be teaching at NKU. And that's uh, really the prize part. That's where we um, can send our young people. That's where I went to uh, get our degrees so that we can uh, follow Dr. Paul Tancati's uh, path and as we learn about history, share it with others. And so many of you do. So many of you have actually presented programs here with us. Dr. Tenkati is Professor of History and Director of the Center for Public History at NKU. And he's going to talk to us tonight about the Roebling Suspension Bridge. Let's welcome Dr. Paul Tenkati. Well, good evening. So many wonderful things. Tom, congratulations on another, yet another book. And congratulations that Boone County is moving ahead so rapidly and the state markers. And uh, what else do we have to congratulate people on? Just being here tonight. Thank you for being here. And Marcia, this is a big event. This is, this is huge. This is nationally going to be very important. The video, and that is next Thursday. So um, I'm proud to be associated with many of you know. He's a resident of Boone County, Dr. Eric Jackson. And so what a marvelous uh, event that will be. So tonight we're going to discuss John Roebling and his suspension bridge in Covington. Some of this stuff I think you already know. Can everybody hear me? Okay. And some of it you might not know. So feel free to stop me at any point by popping up your hands and giving me some questions if you so desire. Well, what did we ever do before bridges? I mean, what did we do before the Brent Spence Bridge? <laughs> I, I, we probably used ferries and got across the river more quickly and safely than we do now. But we're, we're not going to talk, we're not here to talk about the Brent Spence Bridge. But I do want to say one thing about the Brent Spence Bridge. It's named after Congressman Brent Spence, who represented Northern Kentucky for 32 years in Congress. And let's, whatever we do, if we put that bridge back, let's give him an appropriate bridge, a beautiful bridge to carry on his name. Let's not rename it. He needs something after 32 years of service. He's the one to help get what for Boone County? The airport. He helped to get the IRS for Covington. He was very important in the Bretton Woods uh, conference and, uh, you know, all many, many things from FDR's administration forward. And if we don't want to name a bridge after him, because God knows he deserves something better than the old bridge, maybe we can at least fix the old bridge and name it after him, or let's name something else after him, right? Something appropriate that we all can be proud of. Well, ferries. That's how you got across the river. And Thomas Kennedy was the operator of a ferry that was actually started by his brother in 1789. He moved on the Cincinnati side about a year later or so. Thomas Kennedy came to Covington and they operated this ferry between Covington and Cincinnati. Now there were a problem that were associated with ferries. Number one, they did not operate 24-7, you know, like our online internet or like the Boone County Public Library is literally 24-7, right? Even when it's closed, it's open because it's online. But you didn't have that situation with the ferries. Nor did they operate during times of heavy flooding because it would have been too dangerous, right? The currents 
could have swept them and everybody else away. Nor could they operate in times of heavy ice. That also would have been dangerous. And of course, most people, if the ice was really thick enough and strong enough, would have walked across the river for free. And even brought, you know, if it's the proper time of year, as many times as it was, even driven their hogs across the river for slaughter in Cincinnati. And we actually know that this happened because it's talked about in newspaper reports of the time. So, what Cincinnati and Covington, or at least what we know as the Northern Kentucky Shore needed, was really a 24 hour a day, seven day per week way to cross the Ohio River in times of flooding and also in times of um, uh, low water and in times of ice. Now, by the way, <coughs> the river could get very low. I mean, and that was because this was before they had dams on the river. Now, in the early 20th century, they put up some wicked dams, not like the, you know, uh, the, the uh, musical of the name or anything like that. No witches, no wizards. The wicked dams were, were wood dams that operated on a hinge system. There was one right down here in Bellevue, right in Bellevue, in Boone County, I think, right? And um, they could raise them when the water was low and hence hold back some water. If the water was high, they could lower them. And then they each had their own little locks to pass through, and there was a lock down here in, in Boone County as well. Now, th that was the early 20th century. And the high lift dams that we know of, Meldahl and Markland and others around here, were not until the 1950s and after, right? So, that at times the river could get very low. This, this was certainly a record in August of 1883. One inch shy of two feet. One foot, 11 inches. And you can see it right there looking to the east towards Newport. And you can see the, the great sandbar that was below the Licking River at the confluence of the Licking and Ohio Rivers in Covington. So, um, the river could get high and flood, and it could get low as well. Well, let's put it all in context, because you don't build a bridge in the middle of nowhere, really, right? You build a bridge where it's going to be prosperous, where people are going to use it, and they're going to pay, and this is a four-letter word. So for those of you who are not used to such language, please cover your ear now. What am I about to say? <laughs> Toll. <laughs> to avoid the four-letter word, we'll use the plural, tolls, right? <laughs> now, in those days, you know, governments didn't, they might have invested in these private enterprises, but they didn't completely build them. And so, um, we're going to talk about some things. Ohio did invest heavily in its canals. Kentucky invested in, in, um, in, in, in such things like uh, uh, dead locks and dams on the Kentucky River. Kentucky was blessed with a lot of waterways, so it really wasn't necessary to build canals. They just needed to regulate the, the navigation on the rivers like the Kentucky. But, but in, in the end, Kentucky, as we're going to find out here, made some investments in locks and dams on certain rivers, which which turned out to be poor investments and, you know, were financial problems for the state. Well, that was true of many places because states were catching canal fire, right? And that happened after the Erie Canal was built in, right, New York State. And then everybody said, how can we connect up with the Erie Canal? So Ohio said, let's build a canal, at least some interest in Ohio, from Toledo all the way down to Cincinnati, it would become the Miami and Erie Canal because it's, you know, connecting Lake Erie with the Miami country, right? This was the Miami country. The Little Miami River is upriver. The Big Miami River is downriver. And you can see it depicted here. It was built over a 20-year period. It cost almost $7 million, 266 miles. 105 locks and it was already abandoned by 1909 because by this time it was abandoned because we had things like railroads and better roads, etc., especially railroads. The 
the Miami and Erie Canal came into Cincinnati in the area of what is now Central Parkway and over the Rhine. In fact, when they filled in the canal, they made a new boulevard out of it called Central Parkway. And everybody was so proud of that because the canal had become so polluted and such a literal sewage dump for people. Now, years ago, people sometimes deridedly referred to that area to the north of the canal and called it over the Rhine because so many German immigrants were congregating in that area and many were from the Rhine region and so what better way to put down the Germans than to say they live there over the Rhine and certainly the Rhine River in no way resembled the dirty, polluted and ugly Miami and Erie Canal by that time. But Think of what we're doing. The canal was at its height when people were talking about building a bridge. And they were already talking about building a bridge between Covington and or Newport and Cincinnati already about 1815 and throughout the 1820s and the 1830s and the 1840s. And for one reason or another, it fell through, which we'll discuss in a minute here. Well, you also have this distinction between free and slave areas and you see that you know Covington is in a slave state Newport across the river there's the free state of Ohio but they're all along the Ohio River which is the kind of highway of the United States along with the Mississippi River back then this is where the trading is really occurring because Roads are so bad and, and railroads aren't very plentiful right before the Civil War, not nearly as plentiful as they would become after the Civil War. And I want you to imagine that in the 1840s and the 1850s that Cincinnati, Covington, Newport were happening places. They were prosperous places. Okay, so I just was fortunate enough to, to meet one of um, the descendants of the Gamble family today, and she currently lives in California where her grandfather had worked, um, had moved a while ago. The Gamble being a Procter and Gamble. And we talked a little bit about how this area was kind of the California of the 1830s, 40s, 50s. And that is, this area was prosperous, it was innovative, it was cutting edge, it was the West. It was the West before California and the West became the West. And after the Civil War, we start calling it the Midwest, because it's no longer the West. But Cincinnati, coming to Newport, were a gateway, really, to the West. So you have to keep that in mind. It's an innovative place. It's a prosperous place. And that is not in any way a criticism of it today. That is not in any way to detract from what it is today. Because I still think we're a prosperous place today. We're just not in the ranking where we used to be in the 1850s and 1860s. And part of that was happening right along the Licking River. So to the right-hand side of it, you see right at the, the confluence of the Licking and Ohio River, the Newport Barracks. You see a little steamboat coming up the Licking River, and over here, um, Schinkel's residence, which became Booth Hospital. Well, that actually might be the Fallis Lovell home. I don't know quite for certain. It looks more like the Fallis Lovell home. But you have a lot of prosperity that you can see in this photo. That's a little closer up. And then you see the Newport Barracks off in the distance. We actually can identify all of the steamboats here and when they were built, how many tons, and when uh, they were abandoned or blew up or whatever. And so I have all that little information for you. But right there in Newport, and there's nothing there but a park there now, at the confluence of the Licking and Ohio Rivers was the Newport Barracks. And that was the major uh, army base in this area for providing for the West. So uh, when the uh, Mexican-American War occurred, this was a major um, army base 
<coughs> when um, you know the war for the independence of Texas occurred. Before that, this was a major base. Um, by the time of the Civil War, it, it was really not as important anymore. But that also goes to show you this, this was the West. This was the gateway to the West. One, one of the reasons why it quickly became not so important of a spot is shown here in this um, flood photo of February 1884. Uh, the Newport barracks were highly susceptible to flooding and had lots of problems. And, you know, after this major flood, they pretty well determined that they're going to move it up to higher ground. So basically, it takes a different name and it moves in a few years up and becomes Fort Thomas. Thomas, which plays a role in the Spanish American War. But by the time of World War I, it also is too small and too kind of antiquated. Some people mustered in there, you know. Uh, joined the army in World War II, but, but, but it had seen its heyday earlier on. Licking River Navigation. Well, they actually proposed a series of 21 locks and dams and start working on them and constructed some construction on the first five locks. And then in 1842, the state was suffering from financial problems partly caused by a major national economic depression in 1837, but also from the fact that they over-invested funds in, these, in the Kentucky River and other river systems to build locks and dams. And uh, we do know that at certain times of the year um, that <coughs> steamboats uh, that had very shallow drafts could make it you know, up to Falmouth and even above. But that was not year-round. We also know that in the late uh, 1880s that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers began blasting uh, what was called, a, it was a rock bar at the mouth of the Licking River where it came in. And that by 1895 they had removed almost 30,000 cubic yards of material so that at least they could, you know, get boats a few miles up the Licking basically year-round as long as there, were not, there was not a drought. Um, by 1900, they had pretty well decided that they would have, because of this blasting, a four-foot channel up to one and a quarter miles from the mouth. Um, they recommended locks and dams all the way up to Falmouth. Uh, that, was, that was supported by Congressman Brent Spence and others. I think Gene Snyder, Congressman Gene Snyder was working. It never happened, right? And we know in 1997 was terrible flooding, and then they talked about it once again. So you've got everything kind of coming into Cincinnati. You have the Miami and Erie Canal, which was bringing in produce, including not only wheat, but not only produce, livestock, and in particular cattle and hog. And then you had from the south, coming especially along the Licking River, timber. So during the freshets or floods, mainly which came in spring, they would be cutting down timber, right, in, in the Cumberland Mountains, and tying it all together, putting some kind of insignia that it was Tom Schiffer's timber, right, sending it on down, and then it would hit the mills in Covington and Newport. They would pick it up and they'd send you a check or whatever for your timber. Uh, they were also sending other products, as we'll find, up and down that river as well. And then they figured, well, we really have to tie these two cities of Covington and Newport together. So in the 1850s, they hired Charles Ellett, who was one of the major bridge designers and builders, engineers of his day. He had designed uh, a bridge well, at Wheeling, West Virginia. And that was really the first bridge in, in, in this stretch of like, the Licking River below Pittsburgh. And uh, it, it had a shadowy past. Um, we'll tell you about that in a minute. This had a, a bad start as well. So December 28th of 1853, it was completed. Now, by this time, Charles Ellett was not 
working on the bridge. We, but we think a protege of his by the name of John Gray was working on the bridge. And um, he designed the bridge, and three weeks later, 15 cattle were crossing. And apparently these cattle were militaristic cattle. They were, they were, they call that sympathetic vibrations. You know, if any of you have been in the Army, you, they usually tell, I understand, years ago they said, yes, I'm certain they don't worry about now, to break step, you know, not to be locked step across the bridge because you don't want to set up sympathetic vibrations, you know. Well, apparently these cattle were very rich and then it ended. And the bridge came down. It came down like this. So the towers were still there. You know, the cables were still there. So they rebuilt it and reopened it by May. So it took him about four months. Now, I only mention this because I want to stress again the innovative the innovation and cutting edge in the nature of Covington, Newport, Northern Kentucky, Cincinnati at this time. Now, you're living in the area and you know that this is built by a private company, the Newport Covington Bridge Company, and you've just invested your money and presumably you've, you've done a little bit of a loss here because you have to had a collapse and rebuild. Think about that. Amos Schickel rolls into town. He was from upriver in Ohio about 1846-47. And he made very well for himself shipping coal. And so he began to operate a line of steamboats. And he had a brother, Vincent, uh, or Oliver, who was a captain. And uh, he operates these steamboats and becomes a millionaire, one of the first millionaires in northern Kentucky. And he also becomes a philanthropist and involved in banking. And he says, along with some other leaders, that what Cincinnati and Covington need are a bridge. Now, by this time, there had been numerous attempts <coughs> to get a charter for a bridge. Back then, if you had a private company and you were going to do something like this, you needed to get a charter from the Ohio General Assembly in Columbus and from the Kentucky General Assembly in Frankfurt. That would mean a lot of politicking. Uh, the Ohio General Assembly was not particularly happy with the idea of a bridge connecting Cincinnati to Covington. And that's because many Cincinnati businessmen were clearly opposed to the venture. And they were opposed because they knew that the minute a bridge would be built, it would make Covington more accessible to Cincinnati and Covington's businesses and real estate would go up in value. And guess what? They were right. They did go up in value after this bridge was built. Covington became more and more a bedroom community, a suburb of Cincinnati after this time. And its businesses become very prosperous. And they were afraid, not that that was going to ruin Cincinnati, but that the rate of increase in real estate and businesses would not be as great as it had been in previous years. And they were probably right on that score as well. Now, they were also, some steamboat captains and operators were upset that the steamboats had these tall stacks. What was going to happen if the river flooded and the river level was raised and they couldn't get their steamboats underneath the bridge. So they said that the bridge has to be at least a certain height. Well, the kinds of bridges that were built back then, the only bridge that you really could have built to meet the height requirements was a suspension bridge. So that also limits things. Then they said, well, if you do build this bridge, that the piers right of the bridge need to be out of the water because if they're in the water and should say ice build up and you know that those piers would kind of act like a dam and ice would build up behind it and then all of a sudden you get a thaw and what's going to happen the ice is going to break loose and what's right there is Cincinnati's fabulous public landing with all the steamboats and they were right it would break loose, and in fact, later on, this did kind of happen, but it wasn't due to the suspension bridge's fault. But it did happen, 
and a lot of steamboats were destroyed in the early 19th century in Cincinnati because we had ice broke. And all kinds of other concerns. And one of the most important of the concerns was that there were slave owners on the board of this private company called the Covington and Cincinnati Bridge Company. And there were all ready by the 1840s a number of people both in Cincinnati and in the State House in Columbus that were concerned about giving any advantages to a company that was based in a southern slave state and had some board members who owned slaves. So this was an ethical concern. By the 1840s and 50s, this was becoming a major ethical concern. And if you tie it in with all those other concerns, all of a sudden now, you're going to lose traction in the Ohio General Assembly. What the Ohio General Assembly did, finally, I think it was 1847, is they approved a charter, but they included all these other things. The bridge had to be so high, the piers had to be on the, the, the you know, uh, each shore of the river. Um, it had to be so long, uh, and it could not be built in direct alignment with any Cincinnati street. Now, if you've ever gone down to Covington's Looking Riverside and looked across the river, you'll notice something. The north-south streets of Covington are in perfect alignment with the north-south running streets of Cincinnati. That was not accidental. And Roebling himself, who would design this city, <coughs> dreamt of the opportunity to have a bridge that would connect with the streets of Covington and Cincinnati and would be lined by gas lighting so that in the evening there would be literally this grand boulevard which he felt would be one of the grandest and most beautiful boulevards in the nation. That would never happen because as a little kind of slap in the face and also for some other reasons, the Ohio General Assembly said this bridge company will not build a bridge in direct alignment, meaning that the exit entrance exit ramps to the bridge would have to come between streets. That's what happened. They had to buy up property on both sides of the river which made it a little more expensive, gotcha, right, to do the bridge. But it also had something to do with the federal fugitive slave laws, which basically were placing northern municipalities and, you know, in free states and other in states themselves responsible for hunting down runaway slaves and returning them. <laughs> And there was a concern that if a runaway slave would make his or her way across the bridge and first step foot on a Cincinnati street, that there was, would be this increasing responsibility to return that slave, which Cincinnati city fathers, sorry, didn't really have city mothers then, city fathers <laughs> said would be not a proper thing. We are not going to do one thing, they said, to help this project, right? And we are going to take our moral stance. Now, to this day, Cincinnati and Covington have been trying to fix this problem, right? They finally have a roundabout on the Cincinnati side, which doesn't give, it's kind of solved the problem. And then Covington did this why. And recently, um, a PBS station out of Chicago, which does national specials, came into town and I was interviewed. There will be, and I'll let you all know when this airs, but they decided to choose among their engineering marvels um, our suspension bridge rather than Brooklyn, which they said had been done and redone and everybody knew about and was boring compared to ours because ours had a story. And that story that I told them is, and I've written about this since, if some of you read the Our Rich Heritage and Northern Kentucky Tribune, totally free, right, and look up the Google 
suspension bridge, ten cotty, our rich history. I say that every time you cross that bridge and you notice that you're going onto it and it's not in, a, in alignment with the Covington or Cincinnati Street, the history lesson for all of us should be that someone stood their moral ground, whether we like it or not, quit complaining about the fact that it doesn't hook up. Because that bridge, all of us would agree, is the symbol of our Cincinnati and North Kentucky region. And the story behind why it doesn't align is a history lesson and a symbol and something that we ought to remember and even be proud of. Okay, Cincinnati was not only a port packing establishment, Covington was. This was one of the largest port packing firms in the country. And if you notice on the right hand side here, you see the little inclined plane going up. So they made the hogs do all the work. You know, you go up the inclined plane. Up there at the top is where they slaughtered them because, you know, that way it was smelly and stinky. The neighbors wouldn't complain. It would be all blown over to the Newport side. And then it would move down, the hogs would move down on a gravity system on hooks, and then the different processes were done to the hogs, including singeing the hogs, because this plant specialized in singeing hogs, because the British market, the British people like a singe taste to their hog, their pork, okay? That tells you something. These hogs were being many of them, you know, they're from Ohio and mainly Kentucky down in the bluegrass area, and they were going to be shipped all the way across the Atlantic, many of them, to Great Britain. Okay? This is the 1850s. They're going to make their way on little steamboats down the Licking, down the Ohio, down the Mississippi, and to New Orleans, and they're going to get on sailing ships and make their way there. That's how internationalized already the trade was becoming in this area. So I'm, I'm creating the case, canals, rivers, locks, dams, pork packing, for we need transportation. We need to complete that transportation because Cincinnati was a big deal in 1850. It was the sixth largest city. It was in 1860 at the <coughs> end of the Civil War, the seventh largest city. But some people call it the sixth largest city because actually Brooklyn was the third largest city and had not yet merged with New York City. Well, then there's this myth that Cincinnati ignored the railroads. It's a myth. Just because we were a center for steamboats and that was very important, we didn't ignore the railroads. We didn't neglect the railroads. We just didn't build as many as Chicago would later build because basically we didn't have to. We had rivers, right? They didn't have much of a river. Little Miami River, uh, Railroad was chartered in 1836. It's one of America's earliest railroads. It's completed later on all the way uh, up to Columbus and Xenia. The Cincinnati, Hamilton, and Dayton Railroad, we don't need to explain that anymore because, and here it is, over near the Mill Creek, because it ties Cincinnati with Hamilton and Dayton. That's an easy one. Covington Lexington Railroad was Cincinnati's railroad to the south, even though it didn't cross the Ohio River. Goods that came in and were the terminus was at 7th and Washington, and streets in Covington made their way by ferry and so forth to Cincinnati. This was a vital railroad in the Civil War. Troops were coming back and forth on this railroad, prisoners of war, injured soldiers. Covington and Cincinnati, sadly, in the Civil War, became one of the major areas for hospitals. A lot of men died. Not of war wounds necessarily, but a lack of proper techniques. They didn't know about antiseptics and so forth in the Civil War. So um, this supplied the Union Army, was one of many uh, railroads in the area that did. The Marietta and Cincinnati Railroad, 
and the Ohio and Mississippi Railroad where, you know, uh, it, when it was completed, um, they had this grand celebration in Cincinnati and decided to show off, you know, a steam engine. Look at all the people on the Fifth Street Market that came for that. So, who was John Roebling? He was born in Germany, and he went to um, the Royal Polytechnic Institute in Berlin, which was one of the number one schools in the world for engineering. But he just wasn't only an engineer. He had other interests. And one of his other interests was philosophy. And he studied under the great George Hegel, or Georg Hegel. Hegel was one of the most noted philosophers of his day, and it was Hegel that supposedly told him, you know, you really love freedom, you're here in Prussia, not Russia, Prussia, which was northern Germany, P-R-U-S-S-I-A, and you know, you're really not going to be able to find yourself and find freedom here. If you want to find freedom, you need to go to the United States. Well, he was a very young man when he actually came to the United States. He was in his mid-twenties when he helped lead a group of German settlers to a place near Pittsburgh called Saxonburg, Pennsylvania. And there he did some farming. And um, he also decided at one point in time, because his brother had died and his brother had children and he felt the need to help raise them and he needed to, to earn some more money, he thought he should get more involved in engineering enterprises. And there were things to build. There were bridges to build and aqueducts and all kinds of things. Well, as the story goes, he supposedly was working for um, the Pennsylvania Canal and that was between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. And in between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, there are a lot of mountains. So how do you take a canal across the mountains? One way to do it was with an inclined railroad. And they had actually 10 of those. And so at one point in time, everybody would have to get off the canal boat. And they would take the canal boat filled with its goods and ride on up the railroad and down the other side. And then put the boat back in the canal. And these things had to be hauled up the inclined railroad, so the halsers, as they were called, were actually made of hemp rope. Now, hemp rope does not have a strong and or lasting sustainable tensile strength. And you all know this, right? If you have swings and things as a kid, hopefully your father, you know, occasionally replaced them because probably the rope started, right, and he didn't want to see his poor little, you know, daughter land in the mud underneath. So think of what would happen if you were carrying heavy objects up. And he supposedly, Roebling supposedly witnessed an accident where the hemp rope broke on one of these and this thing came down and, and killed some people. And he supposedly said to himself, as the story goes, and if it's not completely true, we'll, we'll say it's a great story and would actually epitomize the kinds of morals and ethics that he had. He said, I never want this to happen to get again. They're you're using wire rope where you simply take wires and you know coil them up one after another in Europe and I'm going to make some really strong, I'm going to perfect the technique for the United States. And he did get his first patent in 1842 with his wire rope. And he even opened, um, eventually, in Trenton, New Jersey, this big wire rope making factory. And of course, he became, became involved in the construction of things like aqueducts, as seen here. And in probably his most known project at the time he came on board, in 1857 with the suspension bridge project was his railroad bridge. Now the, it was two, two layers. The first layer pedestrian and carriages went over and it was wood. It was a wood suspension bridge. And the second level was for trains. Now trains, steam engine trains, were really heavy. So 
everyone knew that he was a genius. And his bridge didn't fall down. Either. His other bridges didn't fall down. You know, so he had a pretty good reputation. He built this one in 1860 along the Allegheny River. And then, you know, along comes the Civil War. And, you know, although they had begun the bridge project again in the 1850s, in 1857 there was another depression or panic. So everything stopped. And you can see that depicted in this Frank Leslie's Illustrated newspaper of September 1862. See where you see the bridge piers? And they just stopped construction of them. Well, how were you going to get, when the Confederates were on the march northward in September of 1862, going with 8,000 troops to lay siege to the city of Cincinnati? Not, not that they thought they could hold one of the nation's largest cities. That's all you had to do, is their plans were, is to move into the city and set some fire to some buildings, clear out some warehouses of clothes and shoes, and take some horses and then tell the businessmen and city fathers that you want us to leave, give us a ransom of, I think they were talking somewhere in the range of a million dollars, and Cincinnati and Covington and Newport would have easily come up with the money to tell them to go away. But the Union Army actually moved in, martial law was declared in Cincinnati, Covington and Newport, every able-bodied man was called to do whatever they could for the cause, and so about 70,000 plus soldiers and squirrel hunters, as they called, worked their way over a Corps of Engineers pontoon bridge right near where the suspension bridge would be into the city, and the Army said, gee, we really need this bridge. And so construction would begin again during the Civil War on this bridge. Um, Meanwhile, Roebling's son, Washington Roebling, served by, in the U.S. Corps of Engineers. He was trained at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in New York, and so he too was following in his father's footsteps. After the war, he would, of course, move in and take over really the final construction of the bridge while his father moved on to Brooklyn to begin to oversee the Brooklyn Bridge. So now even the Union Army is saying, we really could have used this bridge, right? This is going to be an important leg for us. And there, here you see it from the opposite vantage point looking towards Covington. So that's kind of a neat view. You don't see that as often. So they get started on the bridge, and they uh, had the uh, river freeze over, and it's right around Christmas time of 1866. And they decided, even though the bridge wasn't completely finished, to open it up to pedestrian traffic. And then they made the official opening January 1st of 1867. And all of the city fathers and carriages and people, thousands of people were going back and forth to celebrate the grand opening of the bridge which means that we just celebrated the 150th anniversary of the bridge this year. This is showing it circa 1907, looking towards Covington. And uh, this is showing it circa 1915, uh, looking towards Cincinnati and the skyscraper that had just been constructed, the PNC Bank building which was the large, tallest building outside of New York City at that time. Washington Roebling is the son. Now he finished up the bridge while his father went on to the Brooklyn Bridge and then his father had an accident, if you recall, and, and uh, a boat hit his foot and you know it went into gangrene and he died. So the son took over and um, he got what was called caisson disease. We now know it as the bends. That is, they, they didn't realize that, you know, if you go down in these caissons, which were under pressure, to, to work on the bridge, he wanted to do everything his workers were doing. 
So he was down there, and they would bring the workers up too quickly, and not with decompression, so the nitrogen bubbles would, too many nitrogen, in, 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 would too much nitrogen, not enough oxygen. And so he suffered greatly from that, but nonetheless, he and with his supporters and his wife finished the bridge, and this is it in 1883. The bridge needed to be reconstructed and strengthened in 1895, late 1890s, and they did that for four years because they were going to add electric streetcars to it. Before then, they had horse cars. And so Wilhelm Hildenbrand, who had worked for Washington Roebling on the Brooklyn Bridge, was hired by the company to come in and what they did at that time is they added two new, new steel cables. So um, instead of having the original cables, now they doubled the number of cables. They reworked the truss system at that time, putting in new steel trusses. And they did new turrets for the, they call those the saddles of the cables up above. That's when they gave those turrets the rounded effect. So, you know, in, when they wanted to bring the bridge back to what it was, that's when they put the new little, they aren't new little turrets, the turrets based on the original turrets that they had designed. When you think of this bridge, you think of a bridge that survived many floods and was in fact the only bridge across the Ohio between Steubenville, Ohio, which is just downriver from Pittsburgh, and Cairo, in Illinois, that was opened during the 1937 flood. Tolls were removed in 1963 because the state had purchased the bridge uh, earlier on, and they, in 1963, we always like to end up where we started, guess what opened up? The Brent Spence Bridge. So obviously you had to take tolls off, otherwise the bridge never could have competed anymore. This is what it looked like in the 1960s before they redid things. This is what it looks like with the uh, something replicating the original turrets. This is taken from the North Tower looking towards the city of Covington. Questions? Anyone have any questions? Oh, very many questions. I'll take you first. Uh, isn't it set on wood? Yes, it is. Yes, and that has even become like petrified, you know. And uh, you know, wood is is it, it is very strong. And it, so the bridge, the the, the uh, stone towers aren't aren't going to go anywhere, um, and they're they're there for the long term. But they made things. It was made out of the water. Now it's in the it, water. Yeah, now it's in the water, precisely. <clears throat> and I'm glad you pointed that out. Thank you for pointing that out because they raised the river levels, so now those are in the water. So, yeah, the water has petrified. I've spoken to all the wonderful Department <coughs> Department of Transportation people who equally love this bridge and want to do everything to preserve it. They've sent teams down to look at everything, including that. Everything is very strong and still still okay. Now, when they built bridges back then, they, they, they built them really to civic monuments too. You know, we went through that phase where we built just kind of ugly bridges like the bread spent. Now we're going back to the phase of, well, if we're going to spend this money, it's really not going to cost any more to build something that's beautiful, that's aesthetically pleasing. But everybody can agree that this is an artistic monument as well, and it makes you really feel uplifted to, to walk across it, to go across it, to look at its lines. Its lines are so graceful. Tom? In 1970, I was on the North Tower. At that time, That's a good question. I don't know. Um, so uh, I've had friends, in fact, I've sent everybody up the bridge that I can possibly think of, you know. 
uh, if people are working on projects like the Covington project, we had to get special permission for the photographers to go up. The videographers from Chicago got special permission to go up. Everybody wanted me to go up, and I would have gladly gone up uh, before 2012 when I started to have eye problems. <laughs> so it, it is one point when you, on uh, the outside stairs, where once you get up, you, you do need to climb over, and that's, you know, I don't have the best vision anymore, and that's where I could just see myself tumbling down. And because those are, those are all, they're 210 feet tall. So if you translate that, let's just take 10 feet per story, right? That's not right exactly. They're, they're 20 stories tall. You don't really realize that, right? because they do fit in so well. It's also perfectly proportioned. I mean, the length and the height pretty well, you know, are harmonious. But they would have been the tallest things in Cincinnati and Covington and Newport at the time they, they were built. And it would be many years before anything else would be built that would be taller. And those were usually church spires, steeples. <laughs> Were there any fatalities during the uh, building of the city? As I recall, there was, but I thought it was very low. But I don't want to guess a number because I don't know for certain. Yes, Paul, oh, Ed. Oh. <laughs> In your discussion about Mr. Roebling's previous endeavors, um, what can you tell me about the TARS uh, at um, Highbridge. At Highbridge, okay, very good. So um, Washington Roebling was called in by the Lexington and Danville Railroad Company to extend basically the Covington to Lexington Railroad. They were trying for years to extend it, and, and so uh, he was called in to work on that project, and as I recall, I think it was completed during the Civil War where they had a suspension railroad bridge, they had the stone towers to go over the Kentucky River at Dix, Kentucky. Uh, what I've read was that they ran out of money they, before the Civil War, that it wasn't finished right. the Civil War. Right. Um, and then later it was converted to a cantilever bridge. Right, and, exactly. And they left the towers for a long time. And yes, they did. did tear them. They tore them down when they converted it to a double track. Um, that's the understanding I have. Yeah, the understanding I have is that he was that was actually one of the projects Washington Roebling was working on during the war for the Corps to complete that, which had been like the Cincinnati Bridge. I mean, it, it would have been expensive yeah. to bridge that Dix River. That, you know, it was the Dix River. Well, right? yeah. yeah. Well, I. <clears throat> Some places they call it the Dix River, some places they call it the Tenant, the uh, Kentucky River. But yeah, exactly. It's a branch off of the Kentucky right, River. Right, exactly, think, exactly. But, uh, and it's really, really tall. Yes, it's, it's almost 300 feet from the, from the river, and it's um, 1,200 feet, 1,200 foot span. Um, I know but, uh, personally. I've been so, <laughs> when I was younger, in graduate school, I had done some work on um, the designer of that bridge, Justal Buscar, who was from, I think, Grant County, if you were from Grant County. And I had fallen in love with the cantilever bridge and along the Kentucky Southern. But he built the uh, cantilever bridge at, at uh, High Top, High Bridge, High Bridge, and also the, the uh, Southern Bridge across the Ohio. Yeah. Um, from Cincinnati to uh, Ludlow. Well, one thing led to another. I was young, I was foolish, I was in graduate school. And we parked the car, a friend and I, and we felt drawn to the bridge. And we were drawn over to the bridge, up on the bridge, and we thought, we, 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 you know, we, there's two tracks here, we'll be able to cross, walk over it, and then walk back. And all of a sudden, the, uh, with, with the police from the county there. <laughs> Jasmine and Mercer. It was Jeff. Yes. Yeah. County uh, called and said uh, for us to get off the bridge. And I thought it would be the first time and the only time that I would be arrested. And uh, but I t 
talk my way out of it. I told them that the bridge was constructed and such and such. It was this type of bridge. It was done by you know Buscarin and Buscarin lived during this time, and I had to just do this. And so he literally said, "This is just not a pump." He he knows his stuff. He's in love with the bridge. He's in love with the designer of the bridge. He's long dead. He's a nut, maybe, but not, <laughs> not dangerous. So he told us to please continue on, and I asked the I said, officer, do you know where Lock and Dam so and so is on the Kentucky River? He said, I sure do. Get in your car and follow me. So then he he led me down to Lock and Dam. So I I think he he loved history himself. Yes, sir. Well, at one time there was a park there. Yes. And they sold souvenirs. And you could walk out on a bridge, and if a train came, you got where the workmen get off in the sand and wait for the train to go by. The right? Water, yeah. I mean, the little <coughs> cops there had to bring you off, you could just do what you wanted. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> those, those were the days before insurance companies and all that. We all do apologies to those of you who are insurance agents and lawyers. <laughs> I mean, that was good old days, you know. Those were the good old days, yes. By, 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 by that time when, well, this would have been 30 some years ago, so things had started to change. <laughs> 60 years ago. 60 years ago. Now you're giving your age or what? <laughs> but you were very young, so. Maybe 70 years ago. Okay, we're doing the math. <laughs> yes. What was the uh, next bridge across the Ohio? Uh, what year was that? The next bridge across the Ohio would have been the Allen End Bridge to between Newport and Cincinnati, and that was the 1870s. I think it was right around 1872, 73. Yeah, so there you have it. Boy, I was close. <laughs> Notice I said about. That covered me for all mistakes. Uh, well, in terms of was the Ellen Bridge built about the same time? It, well, the Ellen End Bridge was actually kind of rebuilt, so, you know, it's really not the same Ellen End Bridge. Yeah, but, but it was shortly, I mean, it was within, what, four years, five years time of, of this one. Yeah. It solved the problem of getting those railroad cars, too. Now, people have asked me why, you know, there was no there were no plans to build a railroad across the bridge too and uh, I can't directly answer that I can only indirectly answer that and to say that if they had trouble convincing the Ohio General Assembly of just a bridge there would have been even more <laughs> discussion and both Frankfurt and Columbus about that because Louisville would have gotten involved in that discussion and would have said no way do we want a railroad bridge because Cincinnati will suck all the traffic out of Louisville. So I think that's the reason why. Is that it? Wow, thank you so much for being such a delightful and engaging Always. Just